I'm Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly. And this week, we talk beyond the browser, including some news you have never heard before anywhere that I had something to do with. And that's with Catherine Druckmann and Sean Powers as the co-hosts. And that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 627, recorded Wednesday, April 28th, 2021, Beyond the Browser. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Melissa. Like expired milk, 30% of your customers' data goes bad every year. That's money down the drain. Visit Melissa's developer portal for free access to data quality APIs, demos, and code samples. Freshen up your sour data today with 1,000 records clean for free at melissa.com slash twit. And by Bitwarden. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that can drastically increase your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or try it for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. Good morning, good evening, or good whatever it is, wherever you are. I am Doc Searles, and you're on Floss Weekly. And this week, we have um, what looks like Linux Journal in Exile. We, we don't have a guest this week. We have each other. And with me today is Catherine Druckmann and Sean Powers. Um, and we're going to be talking to each other because we've always had a lot to talk about, and we do in real time. And so we don't dally too long. At this point, I would like to let you know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Melissa. Ever forgotten to check the date on a carton of milk? Like milk, your customer data goes bad. In fact, up to 30% of customer data goes bad each year. Melissa makes sure your data is accurate and current so you can reach the right customers. Their tools have helped businesses maintain fresh data for over 35 years. That's why over 10,000 businesses trust the address experts. With Melissa, you can validate existing customer data and find new customers. Stop wasting time and money dealing with inaccurate customer data. Get accurate data that helps you get to know your customers better. You can verify addresses, emails, phone numbers, and names in real time with Melissa. Melissa's global address verification service verifies addresses for 240-plus countries and territories at the point of entry. Tired of having duplicate customer information in your database? With Melissa's data matching, you can eliminate clutter and duplicates, increase accuracy of the database, and reduce postage and mailing costs. Get the information that completes your customer profiles better and more thoroughly. Add consumer demographic information to your records, such as property data, marital status, and social media handles. Melissa's flexible deployment options offer different platforms to suit any preference, business size, or budget. With flexible on-premise web service, secure FTP processing, and software as a service, that's SaaS, delivery options, choose the best way to meet your unique business needs. Melissa continuously undergoes independent security audits to reinforce their commitment to data security, privacy, and compliance requirements, SOC2, HIPAA, and GDPR compliant. Melissa is supporting communities and qualifying essential workers during COVID-19. See if your organization qualifies for six months of free service by applying online. So don't put up with sour customer contact data. Try Melissa's APIs in the developer portal. It's easy to log in, sign up, and start playing in the API sandbox 24-7. Get started today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. That's melissa.com slash twit. Okay, everybody, this morning, um, you've been with us in the beginning, you know that we are working without a guest today and we do have each other. So, and with me is Catherine uh, Druckmann and, and, and Sean Powers, which I, I think have accurately, accurately described as part of Linux Journal in exile. We all worked together at Linux Journal for... Uh, for many years, but I think the news. We're going to talk news. We're going to start first with is 
is what, if you're watching, is below Sean's face, which is his big round world. He is a cartoonist now, and probably has been for a long time. He's pointing down to it. So how's it going, Sean? This thing's still relatively new. I mean, how many, how many strips do you have up yet? Yeah, so uh, today was, I think, the 28th strip. So it's very, very new. Uh, and you say I've been drawn for a long time. That is not true. And if you go to the website, you'll see that um, it's clear that I am I'm, I have no artistic background. I just I, it started as a joke, but I have found that I really enjoy um, making a web comic every day. I wake up in the morning and I have a cup of coffee and make a web comic, and it's been incredibly fun. So oh, yeah, there it is on the screen. There is a uh, blue and yellow, and this week blue got a new dog named Spot. So. Um, <laughs> I like it's, the dog. It's it's just, like he's part tick or insect or something. It, it's <laughs> so, okay, this is a true, like, behind-the-scenes footage. He was going to be a red dog, and when I drew him, he looked like a ladybug, so I had to change him to a brown dog. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's just been a lot of fun. And I found that the, the webcomic is a way that I can be silly some days, I can be serious some days, I can address societal issues, I can address uh, mental health issues, or I can talk about just absurdity and so it's been a lot of fun and i i wake up every morning looking forward to drawing little box people with no arms so um yeah it, it's just been a lot of fun so, so do you um i'm just curious about this because uh, uh I, I imagine you might do this do you do you copy and paste the boxes or do you draw them freehand every time so it depends if if i think that uh the character is the main character is Blue Square because my artistic talent is only rivaled by my naming schemes. Um, so if Blue Square looks particularly clever, I might copy and paste them. But I don't. I, I generally just draw it over every time uh, because drawing boxes is something that I can I can do. Although again, this is just behind the scenes with Sean. Um, I draw those stupid boxes so many times, and the new dog Spot, who is a circle. There's a geometric theme in the in the web comic, uh, but. I draw them like a hundred times because I can't get it quite right. So even squares I struggle with, uh, but nonetheless, it's um, it's fun and uh, yeah, I'm just I'm really enjoying it. So um, I told myself I couldn't do merch. Like that's the first thing you want, right? You draw something clever, like oh, I got to make stickers and and plushies. Uh, but I'm I'm not letting myself do that until I have either 50 or 100 uh, comics under my belt. So anyway, so far so good. There goes my spot T-shirt. Pretty disappointed about that. <laughs> Someday, right? Someday I yeah, can well, have Yeah, well, 29. Today was 29. So, I mean, I'm, I'm okay. three-fifths of the way to my minimum. <laughs> Someone in IRC so, asks if the yellow one is SpongeBob. I don't think uh, so. I, no, although, admittedly, I might be able to draw a SpongeBob in a couple more weeks. I might have my artistic skills might get to that <laughs> level. <laughs> no, the yellow, uh, yellow again, with the clever naming scheme, uh, her name is Yellow Rectangle. So, <laughs> yeah. You, you, you're, you're, so, you're wait, Yellow's ready. a girl. <laughs> yellow's that's a girl. News. I feel like so that's if, news. We need to talk about this. <laughs> uh, so, blue is pretty much based after me. Um, yellow is probably my wife. The, the voice of oh, reason and, right. and kindness. Yeah. I like that. That makes sense. Pink so, is so kind of a jerk. What's the open source <laughs> angle here? I mean, uh, so we need one. Uh, yeah. So I heard while I was getting my microphone ready, I heard on the live stream that you guys were going to ask me about licensing. And <laughs> I, I, I have... I, I, I guess my my knowledge of how to license such things is rivaled by my naming and my artistic skills. So I honestly have no idea. But if I keep doing this, I guess it's something I'm going to have to think about, right? I mean, I know that when you create something, uh, you own a copyright to it by default. But I don't know what that means for, like, the ability to share and stuff. I mean, I want people to be able to share it, but I also don't want people to um, steal stuff and and reap all the profits that I'm making now. Uh, <laughs> so I, yeah, I don't know. Or blue or something. That would be bad. There exactly. Are, there are yeah. There are creative commons licenses available to you. And I mean, if you require attribution, for example, you know, it's all that at least is always there. So, you know, if somebody um, copied it, that uh, either they, you know, depending on whether or not you want money for it, they stole it or something. But I mean, an interesting thing for me as a photographer is that I, I license all my stuff with uh, uh, attribution only, but often people want to pay me for them. 
because they say, well, I, I want to pay you anyway. So it's an interesting thing. I mean, there are a lot of options available to you there, I think. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to get a whole lot of requests for, like, I'd like to hang a picture of blue on my wall. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but we'll see. Yeah. I also, I mean, yeah, I mean, I also don't want, like, there to be my big round world snuff porn out there or anything. So I, I guess having some <laughs> sort of licensing would be <laughs> ideal. <laughs> Oh, no. How is it? Okay, so what kind of feedback have you gotten so far on this? Um, everybody's been pretty supportive. Um, I I did I did a comic uh, about uh, Black Lives Matter, and I got a couple nasty uh, responses on Twitter, but it was just a simple block people, and and it's done. Um, I, you know, I it's not a political cartoon. It's not a I, you know I don't go for controversy or anything, but uh, the feedback's been pretty positive. Uh, my my daughter really really wants a a spot plushie, so <laughs> someday that'll happen. Uh, but no, it's been pretty positive. Oh, and and Catherine wants one as well. So I want one too, of course. It's a dog. Well, you've got at least two fans so far. I mean, <laughs> so awesome. yeah, you have to start somewhere, and and the family and 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 friends. Um, so we, we, um, we actually have a title for this show, which is Beyond the Browser, and I, I wrote a piece um, about this um, that, that, that's based, uh, called Thinking Beyond the Browser, which I put in Customer Commons, which is the nonprofit I'm involved with, but I also cross-posted it with, uh, at um, Project VRM, which I also started. <laughs> I just want to cover as much ground as I can. But it, it occurred to me, um, uh, especially in, in talking with uh, a prior guest here, who's our CTO at at uh, Customer Commons, Hadrian Sparsha, um, that um, we wear blinders. When we're on the browser, we wear blinders. And um, you know, as as I asked in in the latest piece there called "A New Way," uh, a, a number of questions. You know, like for example, why um, that, that bring out the problem with with thinking of the world entirely through browsers, which is. You know, why do you always have to accept uh, other people's terms and conditions? Why do you have no way to proffer your own terms? Why, why did do not track fail? Um, and, and, or worse, been, got turned into the tracking preference expression at the W3C before it never got fully baked? Or, um, you know, why, why the biggest boycott in world history is, is ad blocking? Um, you know, why does the lawmaking that we've had... Um, uh, respecting privacy, basically assume we have no agency whatsoever, because that's what the GDPR does. The GDPR says you're just a data subject rather than um, a data controller. Data controllers are other parties. Data processes are other parties. Uh, the CCPA in California, why did that um, really only grant you the right to ask back for the data that's been taken from you or compiled about you? Which is kind of like a, a law that says, hey, farmers, your horses are gone, but you can you can ask to have them back from the people who stole them. Um, it's it's similar in that way, and 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 the answer isn't so much the browser is that it's the cookie. And the cookie was a convenience that we introduced in 1994 when Lou Montulli invented it, um, but has actually um, you know been used ever since for f far more than that, including surveillance and the rest of it. But it's not. I've talked way too much and thought way too much about surveillance. The real issue is. What can't be done here? And I think what can't be done is a lot of e-commerce we're not doing now. It may seem like there's an infinite amount of e-commerce inside the silos of, of the original e-commerce companies, Amazon and eBay and, and Craigslist and countless others. Nothing wrong with any of those, but you have to be in those silos in order to, to do them. So, um, so, so uh, what, what Hadrian did, what Hadrian uh, introduced for me is saying, well, you know what, wait a minute. I read your book. I read The Intention Economy, uh, which is subtitled When Customers Take Charge, and which was published in 2012, which uh, is nine years ago. Um, but I wrote about it first in, with three other guys in the Clue Train Manifesto, which is now 22 years ago. And, and, uh, no, 20, yeah, 22 in 1999, in the last millennium, um, where we said, uh, we are not seats or eyeballs or end users or consumers. This is a quote, we are human beings and our reach exceeds your grasp. Deal with it. And our reach has not exceeded their grasp. They're still grasping us. And how do we get past that? And what Adrian said is you get past it asynchronously. You get past it by creating a new model, a second model, another model. It could be any number of models. That starts with you having an instrument of your intentions 
uh, that doesn't have to live inside a browser. A browser could point to it. Um, but it's, it's a compute node. It's a computer on your own side. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can run on something small, but it's yours. And it can express intentions. And we're calling that the Intentron. Um, and it passes through something that looks more like email or freight forwarding um, or the postal service in between. That's what's asynchronous about it, called the byway. And those two together are called the intention byway. And we prepared an enormous amount for this, uh, to introduce this at IOW last week, the Internet Identity Workshop, and which is a, a, a an unconference that we, it's our 32nd one, we do two a year in Silicon Valley, and we've been doing the last three now online uh, thing, since the pandemic started. Hope to have it back in the physical world next fall, but... Um, uh, but there, and the day before it, which is uh, normally VRM day, which is I, I put on for my project at the Berkman Center, but also uh, KUKO day. KUKO is our abbreviation for customer commons, um, where we introduced this. And, uh, and Hadrian actually wrote some code that we uh, sh showed working, um, by which um, in two verticals that we talked about, which are real estate in California, and I'm sorry, in Boston, I have to be correct about that one. Um, Celtics fans and uh, Patriots fans, but uh, in Boston and um, and also in Sean's corner of Michigan, <laughs> and they show Michigan as the hand is in that same part of the hand as as, as Sean lives in uh, the around Traverse City it, uh, in food, in basically farm to table and farm to chef and farm to store food is a better way for demand to signal supply and supply to signal back to demand on an as needed basis. Right, because what we have right now in the browser business is we're being surveilled at all times and a bunch of assumptions are being made about us at all times that, that start with um, the assumption we can't tell the market what we want. It's much better, um, a Craigslist is kind of accepted in that, but it's much better for us to, uh, uh, to, to guess at you. And I guess uh, Amazon's an exception to that too. You can signal to Amazon what you want, but you can't signal outside of Amazon within Amazon unless those people you're signaling to are also within Amazon. So how do you do it outside of that? The, the sum of all signaling that's possible is is pretty much infinite if you look at the market in a, in a simple way where you know demand and supply can connect to each other. So that's basically it. And um, and I just wrote this piece, which I haven't even vetted with, <laughs> with Adrian or anybody else and put up this morning, but because we have this show, I thought, what the heck, I'll talk about it. So... So that's so that's so that's that. And as as a matter of context, I'll just add one more thing, which is also news that um, at IAW um, uh, at IAW that um, <laughs> it's interesting. We're sh we're showing on screen uh, the <laughs> our our invite on on Eventbrite, which unfortunately is gone. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, you know, because it was, it was supposed to be up before the show. But anyway, at, at IAW, um, IAW is usually about every kind of identity in the world, and, and especially whatever it is that Microsoft's doing and whatever it is that, you know, other big companies are doing and what lots of open source outfits are, have been doing for a long time. And a lot of open source and standards-based efforts have grown out of there. OpenID, uh, OAuth, um, which was meant to be something much better and more than log in with Facebook or log in with, with, uh, with Google, but that's what that turned into. And there's, there are other generations of all OAuth now, but we focused almost entirely on SSI, self-sovereign identity, which um, we've had a number of guests on the show uh, and we will have more again because it's kind of a hot topic. And DIDs, which are digital IDs and something called DIDCOM, which, um, which is just, these are, it's also an SSI thing. Which is, uh, which is growing out of that. So that's my soliloquy on that, and I invite people to pay attention to all that stuff um, uh, at, and watch customer comments for what's, what's going to be coming along there. Um, it's not stuff that we're doing on our own. Um, we want the rest of the world to start doing it too. It is open source. The Intentron and the Byway are Apache licensed. Uh, Hadrian, our CTO, uh, is, has, was with uh, the Apache Foundation for many years, and so, you know, so that's that. So, so guys, this is news to you too. I think not so much to Catherine. I think a bit, but, not so uh, much. To me, a bit. to me a little bit. We we talked some uh, on a, on a podcast together about uh, maybe the before this 
was fleshed out even. We, we talked a, a bit about Beyond the Browser. So I'm, I'm curious what this looks like now. Uh, you know, when, when we were talking on the podcast, and I'm sorry that not, not everybody was with us on the podcast, but uh, we talked about, you know, the, the browser kind of being this... Um, this frustration uh, in that we're we're just consumers through through the browser, and that you know other other aspects might make the privacy experience better. What does it look like now? This has been fleshed out, obviously, a lot more, uh, and I need to read the article because it sounds fascinating. Uh, but what does it look like from an end user standpoint? How is it how is it going to change my life? What is what is it going to look like for me? Uh, at, you know, when I'm participating in society technologically, right? Okay, so let me, uh, I, I, it's not so much fleshed out as boned out. I think we have the <laughs> skeleton now. We do not have UI. <laughs> we, you know, so it's, it's, uh, um, it's, it, again, it's a model. Like we have, we have the client server model. That's the model that we're using with, um, uh, with the browser. Um, this is a, you know, a, um, uh, a, 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 a customer company model, you might say, but it's a, it's a model, it, it involves equals, but it's not end-to-end -end in, in exactly the way that, the live way that we're used to on the web, and we're in right now, we're all live with each other. This is more of a, of a, of uh, the way the postal service works, where messages move from here to there. Um, so that's the answer, to, to, a partial answer to that question. Uh, we need a lot of work there. The, uh, but for an example, um, we use real estate in, in, in Boston, but the the problem they're wanting to solve, and 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 they're really a, there's a cabal of people there um, that are um, that are all um, energized by the same issue, and that issue is the real estate has become very cartelized. I, I won't name names, but if you you know there there are some familiar companies that um, will tell you what your house is worth if you own a house or what any particular house you may covet is worth. Um, they're in the real estate business now. They originally were just looking at your house, um, but they're in the real estate business. There are a bunch of real estate businesses that are big, and it's cartelized in the sense that they they are not working in collusion, but they're working in the same way, and that way is they want to trap you as a customer. So there's not, there are a lot of listings that are not on there that you don't know about. It used to be the multiple listing service, uh, MLS, told you all the houses, what they were all, you know, what, what was for sale. A lot of this now is is only inside these these cartels, and that's helping drive up prices along with everything else. So what we can do is change the business so so anybody with something to sell or anybody with something to buy can actually directly connect to each other. You know where you know, you can even have specialties. You know I'm looking for I'm looking for a house that has you know eight toilets but only four bedrooms, or I I want one with with a front a wraparound front porch, front porch. I'm just making this up, but a lot of this stuff isn't even in the listings. But are the peculiar things that people want when they're actually looking for or selling a house. Um, uh, so, so that's you know those are if you start imagining out all the variables, and if you imagine being able to publish and subscribe to those variables, um, as well as to the sort of the main topics that this is a pub sub model in in. And and this is more less like the um, the post office than it is like say RSS, um, and I just want to give a huge hat tip to Dave Weiner, uh, an old friend who had invented the RSS that we enjoy now for really simple syndication. What RSS did was it gave anybody the a, a power that um, any anybody publishing on the web a power that the uh, th that only newspapers and magazines had in the physical world, the ability to syndicate their work. And to say this just got published, and anybody who wants to subscribe to that can subscribe to it, and uh, and for feeds for those. So there, there are many businesses that can arise in the middle of this, and this is part of um, Hadrian's original thinking here that you what you want is an environment where there can be lots of competition and lots of businesses. So there are some in here that, in addition to. Um, the, the Intentron seller and the Intentron uh, maker and um, the app maker and the app seller. Apps here uh, don't need a store that, that's at Apple or Google. These stores can be anywhere. They don't even need to be a store. Um, uh, Hadrian's imagining a, a number of apps having less than 100 lines of code. They don't have to be big. They just have to be capacities that, uh, that, that we can have. And, uh, and those can be, um, they can be algorithms. And so, and 
an algorithm that I, I imagine is, you know, or a set of algorithms are that, that pull together our contacts and calendars, which is where we actually live a lot of the time. Um, our possessions, all the possessions we have, there's a, there's a standard that we've talked about on here before, I think, called PICOs for persistent compute objects, which are the, the instantiation on the internet of anything that's inanimate that we happen to own. It could be a chair, could be this microphone, it could be anything. The headphones I'm wearing, those can all have an identity of their own and uh, on, on which programming can happen, and those are called PICOs. If I take everything in my life and turn it into a PICO, um, that's interesting to insurance companies, you know? So, um, and, and algorithms can run on that. Algorithms can run on, for example, um, uh, subscriptions. I mean, how many, oh, the subscription game right now is, you know, you get this for $5 a month, but then after we got your credit card and after four months, it's starting to be $12 a month or $15 a month. And they're counting on you not knowing that runs out and being lazy and all that. Well, your algorithm can, can look at all these things and say, okay, it looks like uh, HBO's coming up. It looks like Hulu's coming up. It looks like the New York Times is coming up. It looks like whatever is coming up. And you could, or we're looking out in the world and we see it as a better deal on this over here. So, so subscriptions are just a massive issue for us right now. We're moving to a subscription economy. How do we make this subscription economy work? If it's entirely up to the websites and the, and the back ends of the world, we're going to be in a million silos. But if it's up to us, we're in control of it, and the whole thing becomes more sane. So those are just some, some examples. Can you talk to us a little ahead, bit about Catherine. the food uh, can you talk about the food business model? I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I was more curious about that. The, it seems more um, challenging, I suppose. Well, this is one of the places where, where there's actually the first application is B2B and not B2C directly. Um, so, so right now, for example, in northern Michigan, um, uh, you know, the, the, the people we're working with there are, are in an intermediary business, but they, and, and they're they are, as a company, introducing efficiencies between, say, the chefs at the restaurants or the grocery stores that are selling fruit or whatever else it might be, and, and, and the farmer suppliers that without them is just a lot of telephony and with them is more efficient than that. But with Intentrons be, uh, at, at the end points, they can play any number of the intermediary roles that we talked about. Um, uh, like the the addressing uh, or the messaging authority, um, and or the there's also possibly a, a CDN like function in the middle of this that that it, again like the post office is just routing things. Um, there's you know again like even a CDN in the in the in the digital world like an Akamai is is you know an efficiency that's introduced at an endpoint that's caching a lot of data and and then distributing it in a somewhat more efficient way. Um, we can have something like that for messaging, uh, and um, and I be me, you know, <laughs> I'm not the authority on this. Actually, Hadrian is, uh, and uh, but um, but there's a you know, and, and this, by the way, I should point out, does not exclude all kinds of other things that were that, like I mentioned, SSI and DIDs and so forth. This actually doesn't care much about identities. You are who you call yourself at the end point. Uh, we need an address to get it to you. An addressing authority can assign that address, but addresses can be substitutable. It can be moved around. Um, the, the, it gets us into that area where identi identities and identifiers are different things and have different purposes. And we can start sorting those out in a much more sane way than we have now, where all of our identities are administratively issued to us by, you know, the the uh, the motor vehicle department or the, you know, or somebody else. So are but you anyway, oh, oh, to finish this answering like this. Oh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Catherine. Sorry. Oh, I was just saying, are you envisioning this ultimately as a protocol or, you know, as the plumbing under which uh, people will build on top of it? And have, like, as, a, it, as an end user, is there some sort of vision for, I don't know, people to have, uh, to connect to this, this sort of um, subscription plumbing or whatever, uh, you know, you want to call it? Um, is, is there a, a vision that you would, let's say, I don't know, there could be multiple apps or software or hardware or whatever that could connect to this um, protocol this, at a very basic level and interpret it in different ways. In, order, in, a, in other words, it's as if you could customize whatever this uh, intent broadcasting is for various use, use cases, um, but, but sort of atomically. Like in, 
Yeah. Well, the, the base protocol is TCP/IP. Um, it's uh, you know, so it's what everything runs on there. The addressing itself, uh, as Hadrian's laid it out, uses URNs. Um, and yeah, look it up. I, I will I will say it wrong if I say, it, but anyway, URN. Look up URN. Universal Resource Naming or something like that. But it's URNs, and and there's an addressing um, uh, model there, and 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 it assists in routing and stuff like that. Uh, the main thing, his main point, has been from the start, which isn't that long ago. It's the middle of last year. Uh, um, is that we're not going to use anything new. We're just going to use what's already been used for, primarily in the enterprise. Um, you know, so there's nothing that isn't well used and proven in, inside the enterprise. In some ways, this is a little bit like what happened. I mean, TCP/IP itself was imagined as an as an enterprise thing in the first place, and um, and it ended up replacing you know like Novell and some other things that were in you know current back in the 80s. But the um, uh, but there there are ways that messages pass around inside inside enterprises that are well known and understood and that a, a geek uh, can easily can easily deploy. As for how it appears to the to the individual, I think there's going to be this is my fantasy and it's uh, my wife Joyce's fantasy for a long time as well. Uh, is that we'll have a dashboard of our own, a, a dashboard that behind which is a, a bunch of data, a bunch of databases, a bunch of algorithms, but. Um, I think what's going to happen once it starts to succeed is that, for example, we'll start seeing common practices and standards for things like receipts. You know, you don't want, you know, a 10-foot receipt from CVS, and you don't want the email that is in, that's just a bunch of text. You don't want your, um, you know, your Amazon account records to be, to obscure, um, the, you know, the, to fail to make the distinction between what was, um, you know what was uh, what was shipped and what was charged for because they do that and you know we need things in, that, that are done to our convenience and right now they're not they're done to the company's convenience in order to keep you trapped and it's not a big step to get out of that or a big step to turn that into you know comma separator to have separated values you could drop into a spreadsheet or a program so um, and we're getting some questions. That, but oh, we're getting, I, I, getting some I, questions, but, but he, okay, go ahead, and then we have to get to I, an ad. So, okay, <laughs> go ahead. My, this is my, just my really quick question. I'm from northern sure. Michigan. We talked about food in northern Michigan. Let's yeah. say that I am uh, a baker who makes jalapeno bacon churros, which is ironic because I'm a vegetarian. But let's say that I have that. How does this yeah. model change the way that I, I do business with individuals who might want to try my bacon jalapeno churro? I mean, uh, what? You know, on the day-to-day -day basis, how does this change from me putting up a website and, you know, letting people order from it? This is an important point. Um, there will be channels, essentially, that are for every specialty there is. And, um, and I see, I, I, I do see something that's kind of a substitute for advertising, that where, where on both the buy and the sell side, there are ways that, that uh, customers and companies can inform um, those interested, you know, somebody likes churros, somebody's heard, heard about churros, they subscribe to a channel that has, you know, bacon and jalapeno chur churros on it, or churros that could have that. And I just see a whole new set of norms that grow out of that. I am going to, I'm going to get to our sponsor, but first, uh, first, but then I'm going to um, get to what I'm seeing on the back channel that's helping explain what I have not explained well enough so far. But but first, I have to let you know that uh, this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Bitwarden. Uh, what is the easiest way for businesses and individuals to store, share, and sync sensitive data? Well, Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, on the go, or at work. One of the biggest challenges for businesses is to empower employees to follow password management best practices. By giving your employees Bitwarden, they can securely store credentials spanning across personal and business worlds. Every Bitwarden account begins with the creation of a personal vault, which allows the user to store their own personal credentials. Use Bitwarden for your business. When an individual joins a team or company, they can be assigned to the organizational vault for access to shared credentials. Quicker access means quicker productivity. Also, Bitwarden is fully customizable. You can turn on or off features using enterprise policies to adapt to your business needs. 
Generate unique and secure passwords for every site your employees access and ensure a password is not used more than once. You'll minimize the risk of using weak and vulnerable passwords. Customize and set password requirements and administrative policies that will empower employees to practice good password hygiene. You'll get enterprise-grade security and Bitwarden conducts regular third-party security audits and is compliant with Privacy Shield, HIPAA, GDPR, CCPA, SOC 2, and SOC 3 security standards. Unite your existing systems with Bitwarden using SSO authentication, directory services, or powerful APIs. Get up and running fast using the Bitwarden cloud or gain complete control with the option to self-host. You'll be able to monitor and manage security vulnerabilities using the Bitwarden Vault Health Reports with actionable insights to exposed, reused, weak, or potentially compromised passwords, as well as identify any items in your vault with inactive 2FA. Mitigate the likelihood of successful phishing attacks by storing passwords and other sensitive information with an end-to-end encrypted vault. Bitwarden is an open-source password manager trusted by millions of individuals, teams, and organizations worldwide for secure password storage and sharing. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that can drastically increase your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan at bitwarden.com twit or try it for free across devices as an individual user. That's bitwarden.com. Dot com slash twit. Okay, so <laughs> back back to our back channel. And um, this is a wonderful thing about back channel. So people who know more than I do that are involved in our project are, are telling me uh, about what I'm talking about. So I'm going to read from that. Um, uh, technically, this system is called the Intention Byway, and it will employ as asynchronous as an asynchronous messaging system that will operate like an international postal service with standardized addressing methods the sender and receiver will each use their own lightweight computer physical or virtual called an intentron each intentron can run lightweight apps including algorithms that optimize decision making on behalf of the individual using her own data um you know so and somebody also in 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 the channel says uh, brings up micro payments uh, something that that, and I'll just go into that briefly and then uh, let me go find our, our visual as well because I did these other things. Um, uh, micropayments could be in there. Um, I think what's happened over in, in recent years is, is that, um, uh, you know, crypto, cryptocurrencies have, have gone up the ladder of, of usage and threaten in the long run to be the, the, world's, the world's primary way of exchanging um, Value, you might say, and that in currency may not even be the right word, but that's a possibility. Those are possibilities. We, on in Project VRM years ago, we talked about something called Emancipay, and the idea behind Emancipay is simply that um, one should be able to pay what they want. I mean, have a mes- mechanism for paying what they want, when they want, how they want. It's really more of a framework for understanding payments. Um, why should we always work within? the constraints of what the supplier uh, requires. I mean, we should, and, and actually we worked for a while on something for public radio um, and, and public broadcasting where rather than waiting for the station to turn off programming for 10 days while they, while they plead poverty and beg for money, um, instead at any given time you happen to like something, you could pay, you could just you'd do micro accounting. You know, we had something called Listen Log uh, that worked on one of the um, radio listening apps um, and that uh, that would log what you've been listening to, and at the end of a given time, you could your algorithm, your intentron-based algorithm, could run a thing saying, "Hey, you know what? You listened, um, uh, for, you know, listened this much to station A and this much to station B." You could do it with music. You know, we had talked about a penny a song, any song you heard that say Shazam recognized while you were, you know, you just turned Shazam on all the time or something like it. That would identify every, music, every piece of music you listen to. You look down the list and decide what you'd like to pay for, let's say, at a penny a listen. It puts much more pricing in the hands of the user, but it also puts in the hands of the user the opportunity to be generous with it and to care about it. So so anyway, so, so back to you guys and the back channel and start looking over there. 
so all, it, all I heard is I, that I'm going to get a penny every time somebody looks at my comic. That, that's what <laughs> there I'm you go. That's think, it. Yeah, I, I heard, mean, that could yeah, be it. That, that totally could be I it. Do that. And you could put, I mean, imagine if you had, you know, your own, I just made this up, but I mean, if you're on your own eyeball tracking, right? This is one of the big new things that like you're being spied on all the time. You know, what are your eyes looking at? But I mean, I would, you know, if I spent more time looking at, at your cartoon than XKCD, well, yeah, you'd get more money <laughs> than Randall Monroe would for XKCD, right? That's, uh, you know, but there are lots of measures we could have. We could even have something in our browsers. Again, the browser is useful for things for us too, um, you know, or in anything else that we're using that, that not only measures you, uh, usage, like Rescue Time is one of those programs that looks at, looks at your usage of, and how you spend your time. But that could be monetary. You know, what do I care about and why? You know, that's an, that should be interesting to us. Um, and we should be able to do our own stuff with that information rather than, you know, always relying on the big guys. The big guys can always help. I mean, I'd love to have Nike help me with my, you know, with my fitness, for example. You know, or or some diet company help me with my fatness, <laughs> whatever whatever it happens to be. But you know, each of us as individuals should be in control, and we should also be able to form groups with it. You know, this could I mean, this doesn't have to be purely personal. It could be social as well, but social in a in the really truly human sense rather than in the controlled you live in a in a silo sense. So, do you envision this being like? Pluggable. So, so let's say um, I'm Instagram, and and I want to uh, have a feature where you know if somebody looking at Instagram sees a couch they like, they can tap something and say, "Hey, find me a couch like that." I mean, do you, do you envision this being something that anybody could plug into and and start broadcasting these these intents? Um, yeah, and and they don't, and they could be means. anonymous. Yeah, and I think they could be anonymous. I mean. Uh, Anonymity is, is anonymity is highly underrated and I think not well understood. To be anonymous means to be nameless. It doesn't mean to mean to be inhuman or faceless. Um, there's a reason that in the world we don't walk around with a name badge. Um, we, you know, we we are clothed and our clothing sends a signal about us. Um, uh, there's an old joke that the best way to rob a jewelry store is to come in very well dressed because you look like a good customer. But um, but we're all you know, we're all sending signals in the marketplace, in a, in a true marketplace, in an original, natural marketplace. Like you have, say, at a farmer's market. You know, you look. You know, you're you're anonymous. You're not you're nameless to begin with, but you're signaling that you're interested. I'm looking at potatoes now. I'm looking at. I want uh, fancy mushrooms. You know, I want. Uh, you know, this kind of citrus or that kind. You know, and that's. You know, the, all of those are are signals we we send without giving our names away because that's a burden. You know, you don't want to know, you know, you don't want to know everything about everybody else. That's a, you know, one of the, I mean, one of the, one of the biggest problems that we have in computing is that there's been an imperative over the last 10 or 15 years that, geez, since you can know everything, why not know everything? We can put it all in a giant database and we can parse that. Um, there have been plenty of studies done on, on, on the ability of, of, on, on, on the greater veracity of research be, uh, being on limited data uh, data sums rather than than massive data sums where you can f find the typicalities and start following those down the track. This is what detectives do. Um, this is what you know what good intelligence does in, in intelligence services. You're not looking at absolutely everything. You're looking at things that are that, that have little giveaways to them and th that that you can start following down one th one one thread or another. Um, you know, <laughs> Uh, Hadrian Hadri 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 actually is in the, is in here, you know he's a bit warden. Interesting, <laughs> yeah, um, you know. So um, boy, it's too it's too much to read. This is an active back channel. <laughs> One of them says, Catherine, you could publish your intent on Instagram or anonymously on the byway. So that's the thing. I mean, we're we're really looking at a model that goes that's that's alongside, but in many ways more broad than what we can possibly do with a browser and that's using the HTTP protocol and relying on cookies on other parties' parts to remember stuff for us. That's a very limited model and we don't realize how limited it is in part because it is so successful and because it is so useful. It's not like in and itself is a problem except in ways that, you know, we have, you know, wanton surveillance and stuff like that, which is a downside. But we can, so, we can have other models so, and this is one of those models. 
a lot of it's about choice, right? We, where we own our data and we decide what data we want to share. And uh, I, what I like about this is that it's, it seems to be that you're talking about more than just the online experience. I mean, um, you know, if I go to a grocery store now and I'm wearing a face mask from COVID, it's kind of like shopping in incognito mode. Uh, but the ability to decide what we share with people and, and what we what data we gather, I, I, I guess I can, I can see how that would make for a better um, connected experience. Um, but I, I see what you also mean that it's just uh, it's not quite fleshed out. The bones are there because there's a there's a lot to be built on that because it's kind of a whole different uh different way of thinking about data transfers. So um, my interest yeah. is peaked, Doc. Oh, good, good. I, so <laughs> one of our cabals says uh, uh, to answer Catherine, uh, Intent Intentron, uh, Intentrons, which are private personal compute nodes on both the buy and the sell side are what we're talking about here. The demand side publishes a request or an intention to buy interested suppliers subscribe to a channel by interest. The supplier's Intentron listens for the things they're well, this works in both ways, and um, and so you know, I mean, a part of this is an invitation to imagine out, you know, start imagining out how, you know, starting with how markets always have worked. You know, you have you have buyers, you have sellers. Um, uh, in a natural market, um, they have equal power. You know, they, they you know, I, I can buy or not buy. I have a lot of choice here. A lot of people are showing showing me tomatoes. I'll pick the ones I like best, or the you know the out you know the farmers I'm most familiar with, um, but we put this on the internet and we have many more ways of signaling and that are available to us. What should some of those be? So that's really where we're you know you know where we're going with this. Uh, one of the guys in the back channel says, I guess it's a guy. Specs, uh, big companies spend billions to create rent-seeking monopolies and regulatory capture. Yeah, um, and that's exactly right. That got a plus one. You know. Another one, Chicken Head says, shopping incognito for a burrito. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> and now we're, for those of you watching on video, here's our back channel, right? So this is, this is possibly the most yeah, interactive and involved uh, one good. of these we've had so far. But, you know, you know, I mean, part of this, too, for me, speaking personally, is that, how else can I speak? <laughs> but anyway, is, is that, you know, I've been at this since, I mean... I've been around Linux since 94, since it was at 1.0, and uh, I've been with Linux Journal f from 96, but I started, I mean, it was with Phil Hughes when he decided he wasn't going to call it the Free Software Journal, um, he was going to call it Linux Journal, and I don't know what happened between him and him and Richard Stallman that made that happen, but I think Linux showed up is what happened. Um, but, you know, this, this kind of freedom in the whole marketplace is something I've wanted for a long time, and I've seen implicit in open source. Um, and, and what I saw happen, and I think a lot of us, it's not me alone, saw happen is that we, we developed the first generation of, of the web, especially, on an old industrial model. And so we now have, instead of, you know, Andrew Carnegie and, uh, and John D. Rockefeller, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg and, you know, the guys that started Google, and I don't think they meant it to be that way, but that's what it is. They're... They're the equivalent of the modern railroad barons. And, um, but I don't think that we need the government to come in and change that. I, 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 and I say that because I think the GDPR and the CCP are in their own separate ways of fail. Um, they've made the, the web harder to use and not easier and um, have been taken advantage of in a lot of ways by the perpetrators. So, but I think with, um, but I think if we have other models where we can do much better signaling between demand and supply in both directions um, outside of the big silos and have what Brian Bellendorf, um, uh, who's been a guest on here too, um, calls minimum viable centralization. We'll still have centralization, but we'll, it'll, be, it'll be minimized by maximized activity outside of all the centralizers. And it doesn't mean that you know Facebook and Google and Apple and the rest of them go away. They'll just do what they do best and there will be other other players doing what they do best as well that's outside the scope of what what uh, controlling giants can do. So I assume because of who you are, well, I hate to assume, but, you know, ass out of you <laughs> and me, but um, because of who you are and who's involved in this project, the, the, the by, you envision the byway is a very open thing. It's not, you know, open to anybody, like... Had, who has who accesses the byway? Any or is it meant to exclude 
um, you know, the Facebooks of the world or, or, or what? No. Is it, I mean, it's obviously well, meant to improve upon the existing um, communication channels, but, you know, I just wonder, I assume this is a very open, you know, on-ramps everywhere situation. Well, you know, speaking of cartoons, um, a good friend, uh, Hugh McLeod, who does the Gaping Void cartoons, um, has a, his most famous one is the show is the dinosaur and says never try to sell a meteor to a dinosaur. You know, it only annoys, it only does, it won't work and it annoys <laughs> the dinosaur. Um, it's, you know, I, I do not expect any of the bigs to, um, to welcome or try to embrace this until they have to. I mean, it, but I think when it happens, it'll be like, like IBM and much later Microsoft embraced open source uh, with open arms. And, and it'll be when they realize that they can't run it. <laughs> You know, and, and uh, in IBM's case, they realized that most of their engineers were already using Linux, and they were using it on old, on old Windows laptops and old Windows computers, and they were using it to run Samba and and do Windows-like uh, file and print service. And um, and with Microsoft, I think a similar thing happened much later. And uh, and so you know, uh, it's they'll come along, but I think this is outside their model in, in much the same way as as the web itself was outside the model and the internet was outside the model of, 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 um, of the AOLs and, you know, CompuServe's and prodigies of the world, which were online services, but entirely siloed. And, you know, but the, the, the TCP IP running under everything, that's, I don't think that's ever gonna go away. I think it'll be digital for the next thousand years. We may substitute some other protocol for that one, but I'm not sure we ever will, it, because it's too, it's too open. So I think pretty much everything's possible. It's not, yeah. and it's not just in this model. There'll be many models. So we're talking I about, could, I, I mean, see it's decentralization. Companies. No, no, I was just saying, I mean, it's largely decentralization, yeah. right? I mean, this is the farmer's market of, uh, you know, model of the internet where, you know, we could actually do things locally, even though the internet is global. That doesn't mean it has to go around the world or go to one central giant place in order for us to benefit. Um, uh, yeah. Again, uh, as the as the show goes on, I'm more and more interested in in what this looks like from my churro stand standpoint. <laughs> yeah, I, can, and, I was and, just going to uh, say I, I can see the bigs in embracing at least the, if not your model, a model similar to it. Just because I mean, as consumers take back control, so to speak, um, with the death of the third party cookie and 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 consumer awareness around privacy and and other issues i can see you know big tech giants embracing s at least something because you still you know they'll go wherever the the uh, access to the consumer is the most open right so you know w w if other avenues become limited well then you know the it, the traffic could potentially flow this way i don't know yeah, <laughs> I just realized I'm looking. There are two back channels here. There's one between oh. the four <laughs> us and the one with the world, and they're both interesting. So I've been asking questions on the wrong one uh, about timing. I think, Catherine, everything's possible. And and again, this is this is a model, you know, and and it, it may be a model similar to it gets adopted, but there's nothing the nothing that says new mo other models for people communicating with each other aren't possible. Um, Humans are boundlessly ingenious, and um, and we'll always find ways to, to 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 get things done, and and to you know, to, you know, find new ways of doing things. I mean, it's it's. Um, I just came back from Hawaii, where uh, I was fascinated by the way that the that the first settlers there, um, uh, you know, herded fish into fish ponds, and how they how they you know trap fish in these in, inside these very creatively designed. Um, uh, boundaries for fish to come in during high tide and, you know, trap them there after that. I mean, just a lot of interesting stuff. People are ingenious. And, um, and so that's, I, th I think that's where we are. I think that's what, part of what we're trying to do here is, um, in addition to posing a, a new model, which I think is a very good model uh, uh, and a very useful one, um, it's, it's one where, where we could, where at least, I hope, making clear, hey, guys, and gals, uh, we, we don't have to be stuck, you know, wearing wearing blinders that say everything has to be in a browser, or everything has to be client server for that matter. It can be, or we don't have to be clients. I think we're always going to have servers, but we can have servers of our own. I mean, it, it's, you know, Searles.com, my domain, and and what I had on it, and still do, and my mail server lived under a desk in my office on an IP address that was assigned to me. 
and I had 16 of them, and that was in the late 90s. And I don't anymore because clouds offer more convenience in a lot of ways and administrative convenience but um, and performance, but they're still mine, and, and they're still ones that I control. And, and that kind of independence is what has been behind... Um, pretty much everything we've talked about here for the last almost 14 years now, I think. I don't forget when it started. We should have an anniversary edition. Um, and we're coming up on an anniversary. I, I think we'll close on, on this and unless we have any last questions, which is that the commercial web, I mean, the web we have now really started on April 30th of 1995. Uh, uh, so that's uh, 26 years ago, um, if my math is right. Um, that's when the NSFNet, one of the backbones in the internet, which had had, had an acceptable use policy that forbid um, that forbid uh, commercial activity, uh, they stood down, and commercial activity could was uncorked at that moment. It wasn't that it wasn't possible earlier; it's that suddenly it became really possible, and e-commerce took off, and ISPs, and the rest of it. We've kind of been stuck in that ever since. Uh, so, you know, I think we have an opportunity now to think a little outside outside that box and call that kind of reality 1.0 and <laughs> to plug our our other oh. our other podcast <laughs> nice. reality 2.0 nice. which is what Catherine and I do it's a much smaller one than this one so any any last thoughts we always have we always close with blockchain and uh, so I, I'll go with you two guys I never asked either one of you you know what what your um uh, I'll skip the blockchain one because I think it's irrelevant but the uh, <laughs> Sean's light just went off uh, I didn't move enough <laughs> You didn't move and oh, that's what it was. You became too inert. You became your own cartoon. Um, what um, uh, what scripting language and uh, text editor you guys use? I'll go. Yeah, but I have to mention blockchain because that's my day job. I actually I work on oh, Filecoin good. miners. So um, oh, maybe we'll talk wow. about Filecoin some other time because that's that's fascinating in and of itself. But. Um, I'd have to say that I use Bash scripting the most often. I like Python scripting the most, and I'm and I'm most familiar with PHP. So I don't have one answer there, but um, yeah, yeah. Oh, Vim. And Catherine. Vim. Sorry. Yeah, Vim is I, my... um, um, I I actually yeah I don't have a strong opinion about blockchains. You know, if but um, you know if you if you made a lot of money in cryptocurrency, I'm jealous. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, favorite editor Vim for you know uh, terminal type stuff. I mostly use an IDE um, and uh, scripting language most frequently used is also is still is Bash and PHP by far. But lately, a lot of Bash. So yeah, uh, um, f f for me, it's VI and Bash, but only because. Um, when I started Linux Journal in 1996, I was commanded to use those, and so that, that's more or less where I stayed ever since. Um, and uh, and it's, it's a reminder to me that uh, there are uh, there are people we need to have on here uh, during, you know, in my time here, which is approaching a year, I think. Um, and I'm reminded to go back to the to back to something and. Club Where twit. is that? The Club Twit, and it's on here somewhere, um, but I don't know where. But so I want to. I need to talk up Club Twit, and uh, maybe in in the back channel, you can put in the exact. Uh, uh, somebody can put in the exact. Uh, there it is. Yeah, there we go. Um, here we go. I actually have the thing. No, no, no ads. Just the content. That's what you get when you join Club Twit. You'll even get extras like Twit Plus. Our new bonus feed just for members and exclusive access to the Club Twit Discord community. Join now for just $7 a month and support Club Twit or support Twit as we continue to create top-notch podcasts you expect and deserve. We're just getting started, so be one of the first to join as we build the club from the ground up. Go to twit.tv slash club twit to learn more. And... Uh, so yeah, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Back Channel for, for for giving me the copy I couldn't find on the giant spreadsheet. This guides me through the show, and uh, and and thank you guys too. I think we're at an hour now, so um, we started sure. late, so it's hard for me to tell. And I've been looking at two back channels and losing and losing track. And thanks for the opportunity to talk up this one thing that I'm working on because usually we we don't do that. So any, I, I, we've already plugged. Um, I guess have we plugged you guys? Do you think you plugged your your, your I talked about my comic. About the comic. 
we've <laughs> talked about our stuff. So, so we're done with the plugs. So, so thanks so much, everybody. Uh, I'm Doc Searles at Reality 2.0. It's showing on the video there is our other podcast, just Catherine and me. Uh, also, and, I guess and thanks so much. <laughs> so, so next week we have Andre Kudra. I mentioned SSI earlier. Um, Dr. Andre Kudra, um, uh, he'll be calling in, and um, I actually know him a bit, and he's an authority on SSI and actually doing some really interesting stuff. Um, and he'll be great to have on. Um, one of those people I know well and like a lot already. So that's next week. So thanks so much for joining us. See you next week on Floss Weekly. You know what's fun? Android. You know what's even more fun, though? All about Android. That's my show, Jason Howell, along with my co-hosts, Ron Richards, Florence Ion. And we welcome guests on each and every week from throughout the Android ecosystem, developers, Googlers, journalists, people who are all geeked out about the Android operating system. We tell you everything you need to know. Twit.tv slash AAA every Tuesday. We'll see you there.